Okay. Recording is on. Well, that was <sighs> there we go. That's consent right there. <laughs> <laughs> or else. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like Mother from Alien. You have 10 minutes to escape before self-destruction. Everybody enjoying I, Valentine's Day? We have uh, we have guests in a rare, a rare and special treat today to have some friends in from uh, down south, uh, Silver City, New Mexico. And they have two young grade school age children who are right in the, the ripe age of you know, getting excited about Valentine's Day because you get you get to do all the arts and crafts for school. So I'm reminded that this is like a a a serious holiday with gifts and stuff. Uh, you know, it's I it's been so long since I've celebrated this in any kind of meaningful way that I'd forgotten what a you know just how deeply it's been commercialized and and you know it's 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 cool though it's. It seems like a good year for a Valentine's Day because everybody's intimacy has shifted so profoundly over the last year. Right. Even you a know. commercialized version will do. Yeah. Well, it seems like a, there's a lot more people sharing celebrations of their love on social media this year than there were uh, last year. It's also much harder to sell tickets to exclusive, you know, romantic dinners and valentine's day shindigs and stuff like that so you're not inundated with like all the advertising that you get most years that's like, right hey, just two two hundred dollars a plate for the fanciest valentine's day dinner you'll regret <laughs> it was interesting oh, good i was just gonna say it's interesting that you brought up the kids because i'm after seven years of teaching high school i'm teaching kindergarten this year and that was definitely a thing on friday and uh, those kids put in the work, like bringing each other gifts. <laughs> it's incredible the amount of stuff they brought each other. Yeah, it you know it's funny the um, the the headcount limits on grocery stores here, I think reflect a model of traffic through the grocery store for an average day, and not a model for traffic on a holiday. And so, like, there were technically the legal number of people in the grocery store yesterday, but when my wife sent me in to buy roses for the kids, uh, there were, like, three aisles in the store that were completely packed with people. And then all of the checkout lines, because everyone was just in there getting cards and chocolate and flowers. And I was like, this doesn't feel safe. Like, this is technically safe, but this is not, um, you know, this is one of those situations where it skews so far from an average distribution that, you know, the, the model for, for what constitutes retail safety is broken here. Um, which seems like as fine a place as any to like bring up the fact that we're talking about sand talk, uh, and that, you know, this, this book is a really eloquent challenge to the, the way that, that kind of abstracted thinking uh, performs violence against the, you know, the 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 warm, wet complexity of our actual lives. Um, but you know, before we before we dig into that, if anybody else had any some had some seasonal thoughts to share, I'm I don't want to shut that down quite yet. There's a there's a radio station that I manage for the um, for the, the art weirdos, and we're just having like a, a Valentine's Day celebration on. I'm just gonna post that in the chat. Um, don't click on it now because it will start playing something. I don't know what. Um, the theme is Strange Love, like the movie Strange Love, um, which harkens back to previous a uh, previous festival called the Strange Love Festival. So anyway. You're welcome to tune in. It should be fairly weird. Excellent. Thanks. And welcome the Rev. Hmm. Nice. So 
Um, I don't know where, you know, I'm, I, I will admit to being just absolutely terrible at hosting these events, but I'm hoping that we can uh, decide together and it's going to be hard if I'm the only, I mean, I, I completely respect everyone else's audio only preferences, but uh, it does make it more difficult to identify when someone would like to speak. And so I tend to have a bad habit of just ranting on under those circumstances. So if you, if you want to remain faceless, but you do have something to contribute, then please raise your hand so that I'll know to shut up. Um, I think, you know, I just want to start at where Tyson Yonkaporta starts in the beginning with this beautiful statement that the war between good and evil is in reality an imposition of stupidity and simplicity over wisdom and complexity. And, you know, just to, just to riff shortly on that, uh, I, I recorded an episode of Future Fossils last year that I have yet to release with a dear friend of mine, Violet Luxton, who um, works on events and social organization for the indigenous community in uh, Chico, California um, with Claremont College and has been uh, instrumental in not only getting involved with the Santa Fe Institute, but also in critiquing Western science from, from the uh, perspective of an indigenous holism and when we were on, you know, when we were on the show, uh, which I'll, eventually I will release, I think it came it came together uh, as a nice sort of sequel or or graduate level investigation of the conversation I had with Nora Bateson last year. And you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with her work and her insistence on warm data and on how to undo the the violence performed on the world by abstracting ideas out of context, by resituating them in the body and in, in context dependency. And uh, she also speaks about, uh, you know, sand, you know, she also uses this metaphor. Um, and it was interesting in the case with, with Violet because it ended up being one of these, you know, we were, I guess you could call it doing a kind of a yarn where, you know, asking into each other's, the, uh, the authority of each other's experience and of the, the heritage that each of us carry, um, you know, trying to, trying to make sense of the ways in which, and we talked about this actually, Violet was with us on the, uh, the Lilith's brood calls where, you know, we were getting into the ways in which um, trauma creates, even for those who have an inherited and a holistic way of navigating the world, uh, with this sort of paradox of um, a wound that others, the oppressor, and what a challenge it, it then, um, you know, that there's this sort of yin yang of a, uh, a reciprocal challenges in which a holistic worldview contains within it this, these, uh, uh, these violences. And later on in the book, you know, he speaks to that and I would love to get into this more later, but you know, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself um, in, in Tyson's chapter when he talks about duck hunting is everybody's business. And he speaks to the responsibility of the distribution of violence through a system and the way that the West tends to partition violence, you know, tends to, I mean, there's so much has been written about the way that we sanitize the death industry, be it through funeral homes and factory farms and industrial warfare and so on. Uh, and how that ultimately ends up not only creating more violence, but, uh, you know, that some of some, not all of that violence is physical. Some of it is spiritual violence uh, per perpetrated on one's self because you're no, you are not able to actually witness, behold, and embody uh, 
the you know yourself as a complete embodiment of the the um, dynamics of and the paradoxes of one's life and you know just as a last little thing to stitch onto that you know i i think a really for, you know for me as a as a sort of colonized westerner uh type uh although you know someone who nonetheless you know really really um struggles to anchor my my identity and my my movement in the world in a reclamation of of the uh you know indigenous uh, epistems and practices of my european and, and asian ancestry there was a really beautiful expression of this to me anyway through the work of eddie lee who's an nsfi postdoc who studies violence and was looking at data on on warfare in africa and showing that violence uh occurs in what he calls conflict avalanches and that yeah steven pinker uh yeah uh absolutely questionable human being we should get into later talk about cooking the books uh chris ryan has actually published a number of articles at psychology today of you know just how damnably bad steven pinker's cherry picking statistics are when he's talking about the world becoming a more peaceful place and you know and, and eddie lee uh, his the research that, that he lead authored was on how uh, conflict proceeds by the same, the same physics as like a sand pile collapse. And that if you sort of try to uh, prevent it, if you, if you, if you, if you, do, in, if you uh, impose peace in one area, then it just builds up pressure elsewhere in the system and yeah, and creates these, these conflict avalanches that in many cases may be more extreme or severe and that there are other good reasons why, why conflict, uh, as he suggests here, you know, that, 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 that conflict is not only necessary, but, but vital to the collective, uh, sense making and meaning making and wisdom production of be it, you know, a, a human society or a, uh, you know, an ecological community, um, SFI talks about that in terms of collective computation. And so just to end this thought, you know, it was really interesting in, in talking with, Vi with Violet, uh, so much of that conversation was about, um, you know, appropriation and, and consent. And I left, the reason I haven't published it yet is because I left that, that rap with her unclear about whether the statements that she and I had been making about my place of work were actually um, fair in the way that descriptions of indigenous worldviews are f fair or unfair, and that you know that to to simply speak about it as a third party, as an other, without inviting the the wisdom of of that community into an opportunity to to confirm or deny statements made about itself felt like uh, a, a bizarre sort of counter appropriation. And, you know, so I left in this really weird sense where uh, I ended up having to go talk to the VP at SFI and saying, I don't think that this is of um, any danger to the reputation of this place, but I feel morally obliged to bounce this conversation off of you once I've edited it uh, because otherwise it, it felt like a form of trespass. And so, you know, it's just, this, this is the kind of contradiction that I really appreciate that, that Yunka Porta holds in this book about, you know, the acknowledgement of, uh, you know, these, these, you know, seemingly contradictory statements about the world and that I apologize for the power tool noise and that, um, you know, that it is totally possible because you're, uh, you're, you're beholding and directly engaging with the complexity of this world at multiple time scales, at multiple spatial scales, uh, at multiple um, 
scales of the inclusivity of identity, you know, concentric circles of we, um, that, may I? that, yeah. <laughs> you may, you may have an entire book club full of people who are waiters, not interrupters. Yeah. Well, then I'll just sit and shut up for a minute. Um, so I told you before we kicked off this call that I had written a whole bunch of stuff on a big piece of paper and just like, as I was reviewing the book, cause I read the book like two or three times over the course of this past year, meaning I listened to the audiobook and then I would like, kind of like go back into the pages and things like that. So like some of these things have greater resonance for me and some of them other, just in terms of the things that you just said, um, the thing that like, kind of like, is like blinking red for me is like, um, the abstraction of violence away from a, more, further and further away from society. So I feel like the thing that I've been most tracking over the past, let's say three to four years, um, especially in like small community settings, um, is, um, is this desire to abstract even the, um, even social conflict in terms of just anger and aggression away from, away from like social centers. So like meaning that at this point, and, and maybe this harkens back to this sort of like myth of progress, like everything is getting better because we can tell that we never see violence. We never see conflict. It's just not in our midst. Um, that, you know, with the, there's that, there's that paper, like sort of, um, I'm going to mess up the entire, the entire title of it, but I just keep on thinking about it. The uh, prevalence induced concepts, concept judgment, right? Like, so like the more, uh, the more you're asked to find red things, it, when the red things go away, you start finding purple things because they're like red enough, right? So like, I feel like this myth of progress, especially in green center societies, by which I mean like integral, integral green or um, social or spiral dynamics green, um, more collective orientation, more like figuring, figuring out the rules as you go kind of orientation, has this sort of like myth of progress baked, baked into it, where like the less the less we see violence and the more like we're going to keep looking for evidence of violence right and the evidence of violence that we're now looking for is people disagreeing with each other like even at this like very very small like possibly like um, the narcissism of small differences scale um and the the deep problem with that is okay you know you can say like well that's great like i think i feel like everybody's like finding ways to have discussions that are like more civil it's like actually that's not what's happening um, and in my direct experience, <clears throat> this is ripping communities apart because, um, like as Jung and Parta talks about in the book that, um, like narratives can only narr like a true narrative, like a true, like sand talk, a true yarn that you share with somebody, uh, false narratives fall apart. But if you never actually have that sort of like, you know, confronting your true story with somebody else's true story, um, what you end up with is people who are are able to hold on to a false perception of what's going on and what's going on not just for themselves but also for everybody else in that community and by the way when i say community i don't mean like thousands of people or like people you know subscribers to a podcast or whatever i mean like a group of people like under Dun dunbar's number and so what i've been directly experiencing <clears throat> like sharply like i saw this like turn over the past like four or five years or so in my communities is this um shying away from expressions of anger shying shying away from expressions of <clears throat> even just disagreement um like a like a fear to even have have these expressions within your midst and this impression that um that social harmony just so sort of like this um artificial like patina of harmony means that we're all doing well. Um, but what I end up seeing is like, is communities being ripped apart where like, because these false narratives are never, never, never challenged, people go on believing like really horrible shit about each other. And then like things just falling apart, like at an inflection point where people can't even talk to each other anymore. Indeed. You know, and, and just to layer one little cherry on that, I, I remember, I think it was at rainbow serpent festival in uh, Australia back in 2017 when I met a, I want to say a European Australian that had spent some time in LA and was bemoaning to me the fact 
uh, of just you know how how shallow it seemed like the the uh, relationships were in America. Be, you know that that there's this emphasis on decontextualizing yourself. You know, go west, young man. That we have you know this this powerful individualism has led to people. De, you know, extracting themselves out of context and thrusting themselves into these entrepreneurial situations far away from home, which is extremely um, poignant and difficult for me now here, um, you know, really, really testing and and damning the myth of the nuclear family with my my wife and my child here in Santa Fe, 700 miles away from from family or or you know, <laughs> childcare help or anything. Um, and that what comes out of this for Americans is that we, you know, we put the responsibility for success and he, he spends a, a good deal talking about this also um, early in the book when he's talking about uh, communal wealth and intergenerational wealth and the way it's understood differently among uh, Aboriginal communities that, um, we lose the social support networks. So, you know, like Germany is just like looking down their nose at us. Like you guys are ridiculous. Uh, we also lose, um, you know, so like we have no, we have no net. And so we're reliant on these extremely brittle, uh, shallow relationships with strangers. And, so everyone is afraid of pissing off everybody else. And so everyone's nicer superficially to one another than they would be in, in Europe or in, you know, other, other areas that, uh, you know, pe people can't, people have more room to make a mistake without it being catastrophic. And the superficial niceness is actually just a, you know, a fear-based expression of, you know, worrying about falling through the cracks of society. Uh, and that looks to me very much like the erosion of topsoil in an effort to maximize the yield of uh, monocropped, uh, you know, industrial food products, you know, that we're so busy trying to make this particular ear of corn grow as big as possible that we're not, we're not looking at the health of the system over, you know, over, uh, time or, you know, um, you know, we're not maintaining, uh, that which actually provides value. Um, so, so yeah, you know, a culture in which people cannot, uh, butt heads with one another in what would seem to us domesticated, uh, settler minds as like very, uh, brutal is actually, a, a, a much kind of a much more terrifying place to live. <laughs> it's because, you know, because it's, it's, uh, it's wearing a mask, you know? Um, you got a hand raise from, I think, Car Karja. I don't know how to pronounce her name. Karja? Karja. I haven't, uh, I don't actually, I've never heard you say your name out loud. Oh, hey, there's me. Uh, hi. Yeah, it's Katia. 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 Thank yeah. you. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's fine. Thanks for going. I was, I, was, I was on the verge of just going ahead and interrupting. Um, Please do. This, uh, yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm, for first time joining in on one of these, I was like, oh, I'll see what it's before I just jump in there. But yeah, absolutely happy to interrupt. Um, oh, man, this is great conversation. I have like two pages of notes already. Um, where to... I've, I've had like 17 different things, but I think it's really interesting, this idea of the abstraction of violence and the, the, the explicit aspects of, of, of violence versus the implicit. Um, I don't think that's quite the terms I'm looking for, more overt and then whatever the opposite of overt would be. But there's, you know, there in, in any trauma, there's there's the obviously visible wounds and then there's the invisible wounds um and if you you know look at that within a community then you have the people who are who are obviously wounded by an action and then those who surely are simply because it's a it's a wounding uh, that happened within a community but those that you kind of miss like i think that one of the most 
clear ones just throughout all of humanity would be um, uh, men and women. And obviously in modern Western culture, women suffer most of the trauma at the hands of the men, but there's very little conversation that's going on about um, what wounding uh, the masculine um, has, whether that's actual physically gendered males or that's the masculine aspect of all of our humanity um, that, that we each possess. Um, and, and how that's, it's a silent wound, but you know, you've got adolescent boys who are having complete uh, breakdowns over the stress of some day earning enough income to support a family um, while they're also suffering from complete estrangement from their emotions. You know, like women are generally categorized as maybe being crazy, but at least have a relationship to their emotional well-being um, or, or to, their emo to their emotions at all, where men, um, you know, again, very broadly and generally uh, don't. So there's so much of this looking at violence and looking at the explicit um, actions of violence or the explicit injuries of violence that are being suffered, but then in trying to respond to that, so often we just uh, condemn the, the explicit actors and the ex explicit actions. And by not taking up all parts of the wound and the wounded, um, you know, uh, we're kind of, nothing that we take, nothing, no correcting action that we take uh, can, can actually come to any good in that case because it's missing so much. Um, and it's interesting too, the way that, that Tyson kind of we've so many different things consciousness and mentation and you know linear time and space time and and spirituality and it's it's interesting because any trauma that occurs inside of each of us is going to split us into three roles surrounding whatever thing happened in that specific moment whether it was small or large and that's going to be the the victim uh the victimizer and the savior and so it's you know so often these things are, are talked about as like a polarizing divide division but really it's it's at least a, a three-way split and then we take on ways of behavior either within ourselves or within our relationships to balance these in 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 these kind of coping for our woundings and it's like every single one of those splits you could say is creating a new universe um where we are that slightly different person and then within us we have all of these different splits into these different roles surrounding these different issues and then those are interacting with others and i don't know at this point it kind of brings to mind if any of you watch brick and morty they had one uh episode um about certainty and uncertainty and not being able to make up our own minds just kind of continues to fracture um the multiverse in these uh and and um limit us in our abilities to, I don't know, I'm babbling now, but um, anyways, million more thoughts. This is really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, just, I, I, I think what you just spoke to is the reason why it, uh, Joker was such a, a powerful and important film, you know, cause it, and, and why it was such a challenging film for, us to process as a society because we don't want to sympathize with the the per, the the perpetrators of violence that we acknowledge that we're able to like you know coarse grain reality and and see oh you know you are the guy that shot up the school and we don't want to give any sympathy to the fact that that is just the mushroom sprouting out of this mycelium of structural violence right you know, you don't want to be seen to give aid and comfort to the enemy in any way, right? Even if right. it helps create that, that enemy, like it is, it is legitimately concerning to sort of valorize the Joker. Yeah, being forced to take sides and being forced to declare enemy in order to not be declared enemy ourselves. That's right. Which, of course, you know, like uh, you 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 get into the situation with you know. Uh, Batman in the Dark Knight, right? Where he's using this massive surveillance infrastructure. And that was like essentially like a rollout of predictive programming, sh like acclimating the audience to our participation in this, this you know, massively invasive uh, predatory surveillance architecture. But as a way, uh, you know, as a form of uh, security theater, you know, like as a way of getting us used to the fact that we may need to put this you know, to, to appoint a hero 
and to you know to put these kinds of powerful tools in the hands of somebody that is using them without any kind of process of uh, community governance or approval or consent. And so it you know the way that those the the, the Batman films in general have addressed this, I think, is you know really interesting in terms of you know showing how quote unquote hero and quote unquote villain uh, create each other within the constraints of an ecosystem of maladjusted incentives and structural violence in society. And that, you know, that it's, it's, it's really, uh, you know, a modern uh, Greek tragedy, you know, where you, you both sympathize with Batman and also, you know, fear, you know, like we don't really want a, a world in which we require someone like this. Well, and, and I, th I yeah. think too, it's interesting in, in this, in this hero sense, you can also compare it to the economic, you know, sense where how much of people continuing to support a system that subjugates them has to do with their hope that someday they can be on the other end of that. And I think, uh, you know, that speaks more to the economic, you know, side of, of how things have twisted, but with this hero sense, you know, it does kind of come to that question and we can see so much, so much of it, you know, in the, in the, in the Christendom, um, uh, uh, history of, people having less and less, again, in the estrangement from maybe an indigenous way of living, um, people have less and less to define themselves and need more and more to, and everybody wants to be a hero, but wanting to be a hero means continuously needing a crisis in order to step in and, and be a hero. And is, you know, I mean, you can talk about nonprofits the same way and, you know, and, and when they go, when they go wrong and when they go bad, but it's interesting of like how much, how much of this are we perpetuating uh, just to just to just be a savior perhaps yeah and you know uh, i remember weird studies gave a, a good riff on this several episodes back when they were talking about the phenomenon of donald trump and how donald trump was the vessel for everyone's rags to riches projections and you know, I see the the same thing going on in a different uh, political quadrant with Elon Musk. You know, we're like all of these Dogecoin bros who want <laughs> Elon to like take us to Mars and form this sort of libertarian utopia. Uh, it's the it's it's precisely the same thing. It's it's ignoring the fact that Elon Musk was the child of South African emerald miners who built their fortune on the backs of apartheid slavery. You know, and so you know, you just you conveniently write out all of the other contexts, and you know, and I, so there's you know that links to, if if I may, that links to uh, you know another point, which I know I've talked about with Naomi before, which I know is why Naomi is is you know in part writing this this book project you were telling me about before the call, um, where Junka Porta says that because real knowledge lives in context, um, mm -hmm. because it emerges from one's uh, relational, dynamic relational identity, it's always changing. It's always finding new expression and, and new nuance and, and new form, new truth. And so, you know, you get, um, it, you know, in the same way that forming, you know, ever more narrowly prescribed and efficient economic models that scale by optimizing for the production of externalities, op optimizing for the production of violence that's exported uh, over the hill where it's invisible to everyone, you know, taking profit on the, in this system that, um, you know, those, as those systems become more brittle, so to become the identities that we lean on in order to stabilize ourselves in time in a, a, a violently simple world. And, you know, I think of, um, you know, just, you know, a, as people's brains age generally and, you know, quote unquote, you know, given everything we know about neuroplasticity, it, it remains the case that, you know, there, uh, as you know, he talks about in this, that, you know, as, as we, you know, get ourselves into a, you know, win a position in a more kind of stable context. We, we win security for ourselves in life and thus 
uh, sort of transcend the pressure to continue growing and developing as people, we become more and more brittle as, as egos, we become more and more fragile. And that, you know, that, that's this, this weird thing about the, the, the most privileged people are the, the least resilient. And so he says, um, that in order to remain resilient, in order to remain dynamic and flexible and, and buffered, and alive that you have to release your knowledge that you have to you have to relinquish it in order to make space for something else you have to empty your cup so he says i need to pass these concepts on so i can leave them behind and grow into the next stage failing to pass it all on means i'm carrying around like a stone and stifling my growth as well as the regeneration of the systems i live in i'm getting tired of being a middle-aged boy in my culture <laughs> i was like that is that is so you know, the people that I really look to as wisdom holders and as elders, you know, a rare and precious resource among the colonized, right? Um, these are the people like Richard Doyle and his mentor, Gary Weber at Penn State, who really issue to me the injunction to get over myself on a regular basis, to keep changing, to recognize the flimsiness of the story of biography that I, you know, that I carry as a way of uh, insulating myself against surprise. And just as a, the very last thing to put on that, the um, Eric Wargo in, in Time Loops talks about, this is exactly the, the reason why he thinks people form addictions. Because if your brain knows you're going to get drunk tomorrow and the night after that and the night after that, then there's less to be surprised about. It's energetically easier if the you know the brain as a as a as an uncertainty minimizing organ. It's security, you know? even if it's security and shit. Right. Yeah. That that you're willing to trade that that's the jouissance, the Freudian term that you're willing to trade self destruction uh, to to purchase you know a a certainty about the future with self-destruction. And I see this in my friends, you know, and myself with the Cassandra complex all the time, you know, that you get in these, this self-destructive cynicism where when bad things happen, you're like, well, I knew that was coming, you know? And so you, you ultimately leave your, yourself no room for a pleasant surprise. Well, and it's so interesting because that's so tied to this concept that he carries through, you know, that he, he starts on early and, and, and carries through of, of, reframing what is alive and what is dead. And, you know, we've been seeing that, you know, I mean, it exists in so many places, but it's been really interesting seeing physicists say now, like, oh yeah, it turns out a spoon has consciousness and it's all a panpsychism and, and all of that. Um, but I feel like so much of that need to construct um, a, a false security is based in this uh, misconception of the world as a machine construct as this, you know, it's just, it's physics and it's this, it's, it's improbable and it's all physics and it's, you know, so N Newton's postulations themselves were living postulations. They were simple. They were a few sentences and they were very broad. Um, they were kind of true knowledge. And then those postulations were broke down um, in order to be applied and used uh, in machines and in constructs to, you know, further our, our, our extension of manpower and all of that and whatever. Um, but it left us with, you know, all Western modern thought is based on the idea that everything's dead, that this single piece of information that mechanics gives us is the breaking of equilibrium, the killing of a system. And so we've, we're all grasping for the security that's, uh, that's a static security and that's, that's not actually stable, but everybody's like continuously looking for it because all of our worldview and perspective subtly suggests to us that that's the reality when it's completely opposite. So, you know, there's, there's a link to that also in, in his chapter on uh, forever limited, where he's talking about post-apocalyptic stress syndrome, when a culture experiences <laughs> such a massive shock that it never fully recovers, you know, in, in SFI complex systems terms, they talk about this. There's a, there's a research track on aging adaptation and the arrow of time. And, you know, even put, putting aside for a moment uh, critiques of the, uh, the very notion of the arrow of time, which he articulates in a very interesting way in this book, um, there is this 
view of aging, uh, as I alluded to a moment ago, as a system becoming more and more optimized on its training data set in, and therefore more and more brittle to surprise, or as uh, another one of my friends put it this week, that you start armoring yourself against dodgeballs coming from one direction until you've allocated all of your armor to one corner and are completely exposed to dodgeballs coming from every other side. And that this is how networks uh, eventually undermine themselves. This is how civilizations themselves age and then and then crumble, um, you know, because they're, uh, as he puts it here, you know, the sedentary lifestyles and cultures that do not move with the land or mimic land-based networks in their social systems do not transition well through apocalyptic moments. And so, you know, when William Irwin Thompson, um, I'll link to this video in, in the chat here. When William Irwin Thompson was looking at um, the, the writing of Charles Dickens and the appearance of the circus in the writing of Charles Dickens and talking about how there, there remains this current of uh, nomadism that has persisted through all of history, you know, in the background, in the cracks of the societies of the you know the sons of Aaron, you know those those that that broke their covenant with the the god of the wilderness and moved into the you know into the temple and moved into this you know sedentary lifestyle. That um, it's it is as though that entire world owes itself to the nomadic blood coursing through its veins and keeping it limber. And that when that world, when the, the, the sedentary world falls, that the, this, you know, this ancient and uh, humble human scale way of living in the world uh, will still be there. And that the circus as an embodiment of, you know, a tribal nomadism that lives in harmony with the the realities of the body and of our relationships to animals and our our you know our sexuality and so on, will will be there after civilization crumbles. After the tower falls, the circus will remain, um, and and reassert itself. And uh, you know, I think, yeah, it's just it's 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 just really beautiful to see that as as a current in the West. You know, to recognize mm -hmm. that you know the circus is not merely a, um, mm -hmm. a sh you know this this shadow form uh, or this this lesser form, but really in some sense the 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 lifeblood of our humanity that that continues to you know dart around under the foot of the dinosaur. At the risk of sounding like tremendously provincial, um, this is exactly why I get very inspired to think about the culture of um, of innovation. Like I, I work. I have a technical program manager job and I was formerly a software engineer. And in my career, like basically I see this like this march of institutions from starting from the sort of like, you know, it's it's a cliche at this point, but like fast and scrappy. You hear that all the time, especially as as institutions grow. They're like, why can't we just be fast and scrappy anymore? It's like, well, I have some ideas about that. Would you like to hear them? <laughs> and it's all about like the loss of the loss of the circus it's a it's about the loss of the people who were were able to dance between the margins um and the thing is that like at this point and this is another thing that i really want to write about after i'm done writing about anarchy and consensus and conflict in anarchist societies is like how how institutions in silicon valley basically cause themselves to go brittle and become you know they say like, you know, why why do we cre keep creating like IBMs essentially? Well, I feel like these things are knowable. And one of, those, one of those ways is like, first of all, like as people age, as you as we mentioned about neuroplasticity, there's an expectation of loss of flexibility. It's not like we kind of like end up there, right? And so a lot of institutional creation happens because people are afraid that as they age, they will not be able to weather the surprises that they were able to weather in their youth, right? And I think that that's a normal and natural phenomenon. And like right now, we can use some institutions that have lasting value, right? Like you can't just keep like jumping around from crisis to crisis. And I think that has everything to do with this cultural perpetual adolescence, right? Um, and this loss of the ability to transition into elderhood, as as Tyson alludes to, right? And so 
there's a there's a role for the elders, but there's also a role for obviously the people who are jumping between the margins. But anyway, the um the the thing that these companies keep doing, and I've joined, I've been, I don't know, I I, I I've been working in like two year stints for a bunch of different companies for like 15 or 20 years. So now like I have all these different experiences of like companies going from small and fast to like, it, it happens in this in the space of like six months, right? And what happens is the managers get together in a room and they say, this person's performance fits well on our spreadsheet and this person's performance, we don't know how to evaluate it. It's, it's often the, it's often the weeds of like, there's this one guy that we lost from a company that I was enjoying working at, except for the fact that I knew this, it was making this like drive it like directly into institutional boringness. Um, and this guy was like, they, people described him as tank in the matrix. Like he was the guy who he would watch all the logs. And then he knew before anybody else knew before any of the alarms went off when something was about to like fail. Right because he had tuned himself as this like instrument of, in, of like, of, of, um, of, of log parsing intuition. Like that was his flow state, like of just understanding like, like, oh shit, the timing on that particular activity went from 0.5 milliseconds to 0.8, right? And he noticed over here, this is other thing, right? But he would never finish his tasks on time, <laughs> right? And they, they ended up kind of like, you know, just like making him feel unwanted in the corporation. And of course, like they lost the ability, they lost that, that instrument, right? <coughs> even on the side. So these things, just, they have this directionality to them. And I think that if corporations actually wanted, I mean, I think that a lot of people want to preserve that flexibility and things like that, but like you have to explicitly make space for it. Otherwise it just goes on this like march towards classification. Classific uh, yeah, I feel like there's there's a lot that that correlates with that too, with the the mindset of control and and people feeling like there there's such a there's such a view that uh, an effective leader is someone who can control everything and all and 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 orchestrate it all to come out perfectly. But 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 you know the the one master and all of the rest of the cogs that they 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 play perfectly to pull this you know wonderful thing from. Um, when, you know, the truth is the real model is it's the whole ecosystem. It's the, it's the robustness. It's the, you know, it's the having all of the various pieces working, working together, but it's, it's interesting too, because, you know, kind of on the flip side of that, I had this really interesting last handful of years, um, really delving back into, uh, Christianity and religion and churches and, and, and Christendom and untangling a whole bunch of stuff, um, externally, which was really great, but also it led to me untangling a bunch of stuff uh, kind of interpersonally, recognizing that um, I offered um, my service in order to earn relationship um, and in order to uh, kind of bolster my pride in those areas where I, I felt prideful of the things that I was offering in service. And so it's taking these really wonderful things, service and relationship um, and twisting them against each other. And, and I really realized that, you know, like, and, and I was dealing with this, this much older, very conservative congregation and kind of trying my foray into, into Christian church life. Um, and there's so much that I learned and so much that was great. Um, but it was really interesting because in kind of trying to engage the community, the, the church in the life of the community, the few of us, who, you know, there who were kind of younger realized that so many people were looking for service on a silver platter. Um, and they were looking for, you know, the same things. They were looking to esteem themselves through through their roles of service and um, and to kind of be irreplaceable. And I realized that as much as it's really important to give of ourselves in service, that if we do that in a way that makes ourselves irreplaceable, um, then we're causing just as much damage in different ways. So it's like it's like, yeah, both having a very diverse ecosystem, um, but not a diverse ecosystem that has any single failing uh, any single failing point. Like if something is going to be successful truly and have longevity in that success, you know, success is such a horrible word, but um, in this context, but it has to have a life of its own. And if that, if any, if that life or any critical process of that life, you know, it, is in one, one person's hands and it can't just be taken up by another, um, then it's going to fail. Yeah, which is you know something I've been I've been going through at, at work recently, which is trying to understand why it has been so difficult for me to 
instantiate the wisdom generated by these complex systems insights of our research faculty into our organizational structure and workflows and why you know why uh it feels as though this particular institute has decided that because it wants to remain small it must therefore be entirely staffed by like uh bottlenecks where like you know any one person gets knocked out for two weeks and the whole thing is screwed mm -hmm. you know and and so like we i've, I've been really Michael, sorry we found all the iconoclasts there's only room for like 10. <laughs> <laughs> so but it is it's this thing where I'm, I'm i'm saying you know like listen um we need like i need to be able to train other people to do this work you know like it this the system needs to be able to absorb the shock if if uh you know, somebody is out sick for three weeks or something, you know, like this is, this is nuts. And like, it shouldn't take six months to hire someone into a position to replace someone when they leave. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a uh, very, very deleterious downtime. Uh, you know, and, and it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's very confusing the way that this, this goes uh, in part because, you know, like, uh, you know, speaking to, Another thing that, that you know, both of you were just talking about, this uh, there's this thing about like I mean, insects only get so large because the biophysics of scaling an, an insect uh, exoskeleton, um, you know, it, the, the whole thing crumples on itself if you get any bigger than a tarantula, you know, like it, it doesn't work. Oxygen can't diffuse into it. The, you know, structurally the muscles can't actually hold something upright. Um, and so that's why endoskeletal organisms dominate the, the terrestrial megafauna. You know, you can't have something the size of a giant cra uh, spider crab on land. And, you know, so the, it's the, uh, the outside of the organism. And this is true even in like super colonies of uh, like ants, you know, where like mm -hmm. the, the conservative core of the organism, even though these are you know, exoskeletal organisms, the the superorganism structure has this um, has a lot of like redundancy and inefficiency in it, and a lot of noise and mistakes. And when I was talking to Mark Moffat on on complexity, he talked about this about the way that that the ant colony brain uh, actually capitalizes on on noise and mistakes in its search in its its collective search processes in exploring its environment, you know, and mm -hmm. and, and so. This is the same with the human being. Like we're 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 covered in this soft tissue, the sensitive tissue, and so too are our organizations. And it would make sense for them to understand this. Uh, but you know, he says, if as I if you want to find the next generation of great thinkers, look in the detention room of any public school, because we're still setting up our organizations mm -hmm. as though they're ex exoskeletal. You oh, know, and, I mean, and one, it's, yeah. One of the things I wrote down. I went to Catholic school. And in one of the like, the like, you know, blinking red, like realizations that I was getting from this book as I was reading it is like, is the fact that the nuns knew that boredom was punishment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're using it. Yeah. Uh -huh. They're legitimately trying to squash your spirit on purpose. They know yeah. that. Well, <laughs> so, so only tangentially to that, 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 that's such a, that right there is super fascinating and, and there's so much to delve into, but with the conversation line that we've already been having, you know, I, I think that there's, again, one of these fundamental things uh, in, in humanity's um, history that, that got parsed two ways and, and kind of misapprehended um, and, and there's more to it. So nomadism, you know, um, as, as the circus, um, and, and it being either nomadism or it being the bourgeoisie, the city builders, um, you know, and I found it really interesting and, and I, I want to go dig into some of Tyson's sources, uh, uh, talking about the, um, the civilizations as city builders, um, and the, the, the deep history in Africa of, of the, the downfalls of that. That's really, really interesting. But a, a parsing that I've come to in the last handful of years, 
um, is the misunderstanding of garden in Abrahamic myth. Um, and the, the, so you have the better, like, so the people of Abraham being made into a, 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 a nation of, of community of neighbors, um, they were distinct because they were Bedouin to the north of them, and there were it was is is boot and 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 cities kind of to the south of them, um, but this section of desert that they were in couldn't even be um, inhabited with uh, with Bedouinism. Um, it was too sterile for that. Sterile is not quite the right word, but so this is this is when they were um, citing for stands of sage. And where you would see a stand of sage, uh, you would go and um, leave a sheep. And this is also, and this is really interesting because this is where the, um, the word make um, and, and kind of, we have this modern understanding of the word make, you know, to craft, to create for ourselves, to like all of this. But um, its context in Abrahamic myth is so, so different. So you would cite for these stands, stands of sage, and then you would find one, which meant that there was a deepening ecosystem there. They were, like they're the there was a little bit of life that was managing to hold on and to deepen itself. So if you could add uh, a, a, a lamb, the lamb would eat and the lamb would defecate and it would continue to deepen even more. And you would continue your wanders, but you would come back by that little oasis. And the next time you came back, maybe two years later, um, there would be enough sage now in that deepened system that you could leave a second lamb and then they could live together and then they would mate and then they would, you know, and, they, and then the whole thing would deepen and would deepen and would deepen. And so you're creating forest, not garden. You're, you're allowing it to come into its own life. You're not, you know, kind of going out and planting a thousand trees in the desert and, you know, just kind of slamming through this, this, this huge thing. You're just slowly tending to it by living um, amongst it, not as uh, a, what's the word that Tyson uses? The C word, the like tenders of creation, the, not the curators. Um, anyways, I, the, the corroboree know. was that it the, no not the corroboree that he yeah. the 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 emu like they had the the early on the contest and and um emu law like uh, of who was going to be the the like primary tenders of the planet of this creation and humans have that role i feel like that's a superiorism frankly um but anyways that's an aside from what i'm saying so to finish this um story so that's pastoralism. That's creating forests, not like a monoculture of garden or like an, a, a, a domination of garden. But the thing about make is these little oases and these little practices of kind of, you know, moving through them and helping slowly over generations deep in the life, just a little bit more, just a little bit more. And this is the practice that created like the Amazon food forest. You know, our recognition now that the Amazon is a 36,000 year old human curated food forest of just this continual deepening of a system rather than taking from a system only what we want and kind of laying the rest to waste. So the most curious of these lambs, like the most intelligent, mm. full of life lambs, they would wander away from their oasis and they would die in the desert. Mm. And so the, 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 the people of Abraham, the Pat and, and all, you know, throughout that whole region, it's not just, you know, the, the, but, these people living in this pastoral way rather than a Bedouin or a civilizing city building way would break the leg of the lamb. That is to make the lamb to lie in green pastures, this limitation to its supporting ecosystem so that all together may flourish rather than one part going out and dying and then the rest of it suffering from it, the lack of their thing. So sorry, that was really long and like seven different tangents, but that's, that's it. I feel that as someone who's who's fiercely and deeply nomadic in spirit and has essentially had my legs broken in order to provide for a family. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, j the first time I came to understand this, I just I sobbed. I sobbed because of that understanding, and then I also sobbed because you know imagine these people who live so close to the land you know, who know it's tiny little nuances and know, you know, and, and can cite sage, you know, two miles away and, and, you know, and just slowly tend to it and, and very little and have vibrant life, you know, and here's this lamb that they've been living with in their tent that they're going to leave, they're going to abandon at this oasis and they're going to break its leg, right? How heartbreaking is that as the tender of that beloved creation to break that leg, knowing that it's what it needs and what everybody needs. And then to like, to face that power and and take responsibility for it 
rather than just numb ourselves to it and be like, no, 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 we're masters. It's fine. It was given to us for that. Like, I think so much of the modern human condition is because of like that, that break right there, that shying away from the knowledge of our power and the heartbreak of it. Relatedly, you know, um, to, to again, sort of issue an invitation into some, some sympathy for the devil here. My mother's brother, my, my uncle Bob, was an army ranger, a medic. And as part of his medical training uh, in, in the United States military, he was required to raise a goat and then shoot the goat Ugh. so that he could mm -hmm. learn to, to treat a bullet wound, not on as a, you know, this uh, emotionally neutral mannequin or, you know, uh, an, an animal with which he had no emotional relationship, but with, you know, his brothers that he would be in, in combat with, people with whom he had really powerful emotions. All right. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. So this, you know, there's there's something in that that um, as cruel as it seems, and as cruel as it was, um, has you know at least you know the the you know feels like a very stern uh, paternal lesson in the importance of this kind of uh, situated, embodied, contextual knowledge, you know, and the fact that it is that that our soldiers are emotional beings and that they, they, they need to learn to accept and to work within that and to work within the lived emotional realities of their relationships and to perform under duress in, in those, you know, those trying circumstances. And I, you know, I, I, you know, my, my mom is a real uh, soft hearted person, just thought it was the absolute worst thing ever. But at the same time, it's easy to imagine uh, how much, how much worse it would be if we were not preparing our warriors in that way. Yeah. Uh, it, the, the preparation for something, you know, it doesn't completely negate the trauma. Um, but it, you know, it's like getting punched in the stomach, you know, expecting it or not. It's going to do totally different amount of damage. Um, Well, and it's interesting too. So, you know, this question of what is, you know, what is human nature and what isn't human nature and what is, you know, different things, you know, and again, like going way, way back into our, our, our formation, you know, when we're born, parts of our brainstem come online bit by bit, you know, in the, in the womb, we go through all of the evolutionary phases. And then when we're born, you know, every single one of the, the brain stems of those phases is then coming on one by one by one. And it's really interesting because they evolved, all of those brain stem sections evolved, you know, either in, in the, the dappled ocean floor, sunlight, you know, kind of wilderness, um, you know, learning and growing and, and becoming what they are in that environment or on the dappled forest floor or running through the savanna. And so as they're coming online, ideally they'd be situated in that same type of environment in order for all of the kind of latent knowing in the brain stems to properly integrate um, as you know, systems are built and added kind of more and more. But instead, all of these brain stem parts, at least for the average modern human, is coming online in uh, an extremely violent uh, foreign, unfamiliar environment to those brain stems evolution. And it's like, we basically have PTSD from birth. So it's almost impossible to say what, what's, what's real and what's, you know, because we're already basically operating from PTSD from, from the absolute get that go. I feel ready to kind of switch streams, but if anybody wants to, to, to speak to anything that has been raised so far, I'd love to make space for that. Okay, well, uh, page 129 in my copy, uh, under advanced and fair. He, there's, there's this beautiful section um, that he's, he's starting to lay out 
uh, his account of human history and the emergence of the the Prussian educational system, and uh, I found that to be one of the most interesting uh, passages to read in this in in this entire book. But he there's there's one piece in particular that I love, which is about the why uh, pirate flag is is the the skull and and crossed femurs. And you know that these are these are these little these little hints of uh, a, a, a former mode of human existence dominated by sky burial, dominated by you know um, this uh, you know offering of our, our dead to become food for the ecosystem, and so everything else the, the rest of the body is completely chewed up, only this, the skull and and you know large uh, limb bones remain he says the sky burial has been forgotten and people are left wondering why there are not many bones to find and why the ones they do find are fairly miserable specimens it is probably because those specimens belong to rogues bandits and outcasts who had nobody to care for them after death which is an interesting data set to build an entire prehistory from and i think that's sort of like yeah if, if our entire history of humankind are just the lambs that wandered off property right then then you know this is that you know to your to the point that you just made uh you know we we have a very very skewed skewed version of of history and you know i think about this a lot with the fossil record there was some some research that was just put forward using statistical methods um jack shaw at yale worked on this with with sfi's vp for science jennifer dunn using statistical methods to recreate uh, prehistoric food webs uh, that were only partially reconstructed by the fossil record because the fossil record only captures for in most cases uh, hard-bodied organisms you know like mm. uh, it only it only captures the the parts that can be you know uh, there are rare cases like the Burgess uh, shale where you know impressions of soft body parts are are left over but so we have this um, you know that speaks again to this 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 thing about you know hard hard body parts soft body parts and the way that um so little of uh of the in the wisdom of indigenous society is visible to western history because it remained mutable because it remained embodied and contextualized uh because it dissolved into new relational contexts and you know, so you, you like again with the Amazon, right? And people are like, "Oh, well, that wasn't inhabited." It's like, well, they were building all of their structures out of biodegradable materials, <laughs> so you don't see them anymore. And like, the only way that you can infer their existence is by the the traces that they left in the the production and maintenance of biodiversity elsewhere in the system. You know, so it's it's this. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm about to publish to Patreon this this draft of an essay I've been writing in which I, I cite Rachel Armstrong, who's an, an architect that works with living materials. And she has this this uh, great essay, I think she published it in IEET a few years ago, in which she argues that any insufficient, any sufficiently advanced civilization is indistinguishable from nature. And that basically the, that the reasons that we do not, we don't find alien life is because we're looking for something artificial rather than mm. you know for these 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 uh patterns that sort of minimize the gap uh minimize the wastefulness you know uh so yeah i don't know just a, just a rant mm -hmm. on that <laughs> but just the thought that like you know this this whole question over lost civilizations lost societies is is so interesting because yeah of course if if you have a you know a globe spanning trade networks that leave the metal in the ground then mm. what record of them do we have except for the you know the offshore temples that were you know submerged during the end of the last glacial period I you was, know um, i was really excited to visit a, a a museum in iceland when i was when i had a two day layover there for work and um, when I went there, um, like the, the the artifacts that they have left over from, 
you know, <clears throat> from the medieval period are completely like weather beaten and run down. And there's very few of them left because everything fell into the sea. <laughs> right. And like wood rots and metal, it just gets super duper corroded. Whereas if you live in the Mediterranean and you've got marble quarries around, uh, and, uh, you figure out very early on how to, how to scribble on them. Um, it turns out that's a really good way to make your stories last a long time and to get them script, get them shared far and wide. Right. So like, and, and also if you live in a dry climate, like, um, like in Egypt, right. Egypt, Egyptian, I went to Egypt two years ago at this point. Um, <clears throat> and I went to Greece the year before that. And so, and, and I guess I went to Iceland the summer after I went to Egypt, something like that. Anyway, so like having all these experiences back to back, you really get to um, to absorb the sort of guns, germs, and steel aspect of all of this thing about, you know, like which stories are getting preserved? Which stories do we actually have uh, a wide enough array of sources on to make, be able to make sense of them? Because when it comes to like Norse mythology, one of the biggest problems with it is like, we have evidence in the form of like the remains of stones, like um, stele that are that are lying around in in northern European areas, especially in like Sweden and things like that. That's the next place I want to go, uh, where you can see evidence of like you know the god Tyr and the god uh, like um, who's the guy who ended up being basically like syncretized into being Jesus, uh, Baldur, right? Um, evidence of all these these gods and goddesses that were obviously very important because of um, because of their presence on things, but at the same time, so so little written down about the stories. Not because they didn't write, but because of the corrosion, the corrosive effects of being <clears throat> in a northern climate that is fairly damp, where things just kind of degrade. And so, as a result, Norse mythology basically consists of the of the Crow's Edda, which is a very constrained number of stories compared to the obvious breadth of storytelling that went into creating these cycles. On the other hand, you've got Greece, where you can see, you can find a story about the Titanomachy on like 10 different, in 10 different places, like the story of like Zeus overthrowing the, overthrowing the Titans and things like that was like, just, it's just lousy with storytelling in Greece. Um, and so I guess I'll just leave it there in the sense that like, you know, when it comes to trying to, trying to make sense of like what is important and like which stories have primacy which stories have re resonance like the 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 fossil record of you know or the archaeological fossil record i guess let's call it of um you know which stories make it like gives us a lot of clue as to um you know what what we're probably overlooking like one of the one of the most inherently silly questions i've ever heard is what happened to the mayans like you can go to Mexico and meet some Mayans. <laughs> you can ask them this question, but the, but the fact that like their their writing system and their their ways of doing things were very like very bifurcated between like the indigenous ways of the jungle and then the city ways of like encoding things on these temples, but in the middle of jungles where the corrosive corrosive effects on the on the um, the stone that they had available to them, which was not marble meant that people didn't write as much. It just wasn't as valuable to write things down because it would just kind of get kind of get corroded way faster than anyone would like. Anyway, the end. I, I think that's really, I, I, like as you're talking about that, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that, but then I'm also thinking this completely flip side of, of some cases where um, the history was uh, intentionally repressed, um, and, and cases prior to, to, to colonialism, which obviously, you know, the, the, the general rule is the, the, the victors write the history. Um, but, um, I'm going to speak to an instance here in the States, but I just saw an article come up, um, that bears, uh, further looking, but it, it suggests that there's actually like much deeper history of, uh, human, uh, development and civilization um, in Europe, and that possibly um, not only was uh, uh, has evidence um, rotted and, and been lost through that, but it may have been um, intentionally um, uh, buried. Um, so the 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 Mesa Verde area, um, the story of Mesa Verde is is so so interesting, and and kind of the people who moved up there and created this really incredible culture, and then just left 
not because of any sort of failing in the place that they were or the way that they were being, but they actually, they, they moved back down um, to the Puebloans uh, to disperse their culture in order to counteract the unhealthy culture that was popping up that was basically the Anasazi that collapsed. And that's, again, that's not the right term to use either. This, this history is like really kind of coming more and more to light uh, these days. So I'm, I'm using old terms to speak about it just because I've been following this for so long. But um, the mounds builders, um, uh, out like that, 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 um, were in the, uh, Mississippi river area. Um, they, they get called the Cahokia mounds, but, um, they predate the Cahokian people that were living there when the mounds were first discovered. And, and as it turns out, this mound building civilization, you know, kind of, um, extends all throughout, all the way down into Central America and South America and, and may have even been a global culture is kind of what, um, it's interesting because Tyson referenced uh, the, 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 the prehistoric uh, global elements of, of, of uh, mythology painted on the canvas of the stars as well. But it's very known um, if you talk to um, people who keep any of the stories and the lore throughout the region um, that the, it's not that the knowledge was lost about the mounds builders. It, it's that it was intentionally buried because it was such an unhealthy culture. And th that the story of that being the case has been told for so long when it's only very recent discoveries of the absolute atrocities of the mounds builders that have come to light. The mounds, you know, full of 200 beheaded, you know, young women or, or things like that. Um, so it's very interesting, too, I think, in, in recognizing that both in some instances we're totally losing things simply because of the climate or because of the um, inherent sustainability of the technology that was being used, but also that in many cases, um, perhaps um, there was a very unified, though dispersed, um, practice of um, letting a culture die because it was being refuted and because it was unhealthy. I'm done. That's awesome. There's, uh, on 167, he says, he's talking about the Library of Alexandria. And he says, you know, the moral of the story is always back up your data if you are committing <laughs> memory to modes outside of an oral tradition. And, you know, I, I think about that with this, this show. I, I am so ambivalent in general in my, in my disposition as a, as a human. Um, and, you know, part of me indulges the time capsule idea you know, but then there's this other part where I, when I had um, Rolf Potts on the show, this fabulous travel writer who's inspired me immensely over the years. And I asked him the question that I asked people at the, you know, I asked guests at the end of these episodes where I say, all right, you know, so if you're in a, if you, if you hope to leave something behind, you know, to your, the, you know, the unimaginable future, like leave a message for them. And, you know, what do you, what do you hope to communicate? And he's like, man, I don't think they want to know anything about me. I don't think they care. You know, he's like, how much do you care about the life of your great, great grandfather? Like how often do you think about that person? You know, how, how, how much do you, how much value do you place in the relevance of his understanding to your life? You know? And it's like, it's interesting for me to hold the tension between those two things, because from the very beginning of the show, some of the best conversations that we've ever recorded for the show were accidentally destroyed. Mm. You know, <laughs> we're lost. We're lost to a software glitch. And you know, for anybody who's suffered a you know a backup hard drive failure and felt like they had a stroke, yeah. You know, then you realize what you know the whole story of you know the the play, the story of of you know Thoth and the advent of writing was really getting at. You know, and 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 why why it is important not to allow our, our innate capacity for memory to atrophy even as we augment it, supplement it with these technologies. And then also to know when it's important to just lay these things to seed. When it is, you know, when, it, when, when again, not to, not to lean too heavily on this, this you know, sympathy for the villain, uh, you know, for, for, for Joker, but like, you know, when, when the world does need uh, the, a, a forest fire to clear things and restore nutrient uh, base to the soil. And, you know, when, when a, a whale fall 
is necessary because look like we don't we don't all you know as as again to tie back to what we were saying earlier in this conversation as easy as it is for the colonized mind to celebrate uh elon musk's 1.5 billion dollar entrance into bitcoin um that's just reproducing and amplifying the inequalities generated by the uh increasing returns to scale of a digital economy um you know a digitally supported economy uh in this this new rhetorically liberating system you know and it's like actually for for the vision of uh the you know the egalitarian and, and democratic promise of digital currencies and you know and and the the you know the various kinds of contracts and relationships that they ostensibly support to be made manifest in this world um then it is you know we we have to actually hold the line of this this uh you know uh radically anti-authoritarian uh rhetoric that in which this stuff started and yet every new technology we see this uh, this cycle, you know, where it's like eventually you just sort of give up on the the web ever have, you know, unless you're Tim Berners Lee and you're like still pushing, still pushing to make it happen, oh, you know. He's pushing to make a new web, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's you know I, I'm I'm left feeling very uh, of two minds about all of this stuff, but I I suppose that's that's better. Um, as far as a hedge against one of those worldviews being profoundly and fatally challenged by, you know, whatever happens next in 2021. Yeah, I, I, I love how Tyson kind of gets at the idea that every experience has its portion of truth and beauty and that uh, we are at our best when we support that in coming forth and participating. Um, and, you know, so that, that kind of pushes things so much differently in the perspective of like, what is success? What is good? What is, you know, is it, is it, is it accomplishing the thing, the, the best and the quickest, or is it everybody participating in accomplishing, the, uh, brings more of their best forth? Well, yeah, everybody, this has been wonderful i i would ordinarily just keep going indefinitely but um <laughs> i feel a responsibility to call it when we said we would call it and to say say goodbye to my my friends before they leave i do want to first of all i want to thank everybody for for being here and, and for for um you know being present in the ways that you have uh and and i also want to invite you because you are the ones that are here to help select the next book that we discuss next month out of the list, which I will post in the, in the uh, chat here again. I'm, I, I have no, um, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to read Annie Dillard uh, for the time being, but you know, maybe it's Steven Nachmanovich, uh, such a fabulous book on improvisation, or maybe it's Richard Powers, who's, Overstory was just announced as you know getting getting produced by the Game of Thrones showrunners uh, <laughs> for Netflix. So like, yeah, but keep the sand theme going. Yeah, maybe maybe Dune. Anyway, feel free to chime in on that in the comments of that that Patreon post. And if anybody else has some closing remarks, I'll I will back down and, and make space for that now or or keep space for it. I was just going to say, if we do, uh, for some reason, continue to talk about sand talk, it would be interesting to get some comments on. Um, see, I, I listened to the audio book a while ago, so a little my memory is a little fuzzy, but I know there was some talk about uh, how natural uh, structures of the landscape are almost always in Aboriginal thinking uh, ancestors and often ancestors that have been punished. And I really mm. like the discussion on, on punishment in their culture and how once the punishment was served, it was no it no longer uh, had any stigma left to it. And how these things that they now honor and worship, you know, mountains or, or rocks, 
uh, were once ancestors that were being punished for some transgression. Because when you were talking about like the classroom filled with uh, kids in detention, you're just, I'm thinking exactly about it's hmm. a class filled with those ancestors that transgressed, got punished, and then were elevated because of it. Mm -hmm. I love I I I feel like so, and I was part of a Sand Talk book club over the summer. And I still feel like I could talk about this book like at least once a month for like a year. <laughs> um, and that that punishment aspect is just it, it's so it's it's pregnant with all sorts of thoughts that are applicable to right now. Like if we hearken back to like probably more than an hour ago in this discussion about how like there's kind of like this ratcheting up of like finding finding more ways to create artificial harmony between people it all what also goes with that that and sort of like alan watts sense i use the word i words use this kind of phrase goes with um the this like failure failure to be able to figure out what punishment means and so instead of being able to figure out what punishment means i.e like all right we're going to put you in the like in the shackles for a day and you're going to get tomatoes thrown at you for your stupid the stupid thing that you said on twitter right and then it's going to be over right and we'll all, we will all have done, we will all have had like, you know, being able to take a crack at you and then it's done, right? As opposed to that, now we just basically cancel people and then they're just gone. And then, and in so doing, we're creating these like, these new, these growing cultures of people who just resent the dominant culture, which probably doesn't end well. <laughs> no, rather than, than Prometheus, right? Which is like, that's that notion of like being turned into a, you know, a, a, you know, a static aspect of the, the, the updated terrain. Um, you know, even though it's like an ongoing punishment, it's, it's also an exaltation. Uh, you know, so that's, yeah. I still keep in contact with people that we've banished from noise bridge for, for things that like, some of those things were horrible things, like really, really like, you know, like, um, you know, then bending their, their, um fame and charisma as a as a cool hacker dude uh into basically coercing people into creepy sexual situations and stuff um but the thing is that like as i catch up with these people like their lives have been more or less destroyed by the by this like extroversion of a punishment that we can never end and it's not it's you know again it's just like okay well how much sympathy do we have for the joker um but at the same time, I don't necessarily think it's great to create this class of people whose punishments will never end because that's how you get Spartacus. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's a question of, of, of what is justice? Is justice yeah. restoration or is justice punitive and right. vengeful? Um, you know, and, and, and conviction at least has the capacity to lead to justice if it's followed by you know, repentance and, and, and changed behavior and changed relationship, but that condemnation only assures more of the same and worse of the same, you know, so much of, of, of modern Western culture is based on puritanism, aside from the fact that, that purity is sterile and unable to support life, just more, you know, more generally, it, it draws this absolutist line. And, and that in itself is obviously enough of a problem in so many ways, but then where they draw the line is so much of a problem too because they don't draw the line anywhere near our realistic beings they draw it over in this idealistic place that's completely stored in order to achieve that 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 you know perfection of worldview and that's where they draw the line and so everybody exists already on the wrong side of that line but the line's already been drawn so there's no other line to be drawn between where we actually exist as 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 whole healthy beings and like bad shit and so it's kind of you know back to relative to that kind of cassandra problem of like okay well there's no way i can be great you know just i'm i'm not achieving that perfection maybe that perfection is right maybe it's not that's an ongoing dialogue but i'm not achieving it so like why not just follow my my whatever else awesome well if y'all want to keep going that's wonderful i'm going to stop the recording here um, <laughs> thanks again, everybody. And I